Hello there and welcome to Brian Lomax Movie Talk and another episode of Letterbox Sundays where I go through my Letterbox diary and just fill you in on some of the films I've been watching. So let's start with The Ides of March. This is a film directed by George Clooney, someone who I actually appreciate quite a lot as a director. He's had some misses but he's also had some pretty decent films. Uh, good Night and Good Luck being a pretty good standout for me. Uh, but yeah, this is a political thriller. And a very good one, I think. It's got some of my favourite actors, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman being one of them, obviously Paul Giamatti, and Ryan Gosling, who I just really like in everything that he does as well. He's great here as this guy who is a political kind of media doctor. He handles the media side of, of a campaign. And... He is essentially in love, uh, not, not in any kind of romantic sense, with the man he is helping to try and get into the, the presidency, um, played by George Clooney. And it's really a film all about how idealism and the, the, the things we love about politics suddenly kind of get twisted, bent out of shape and turn into something ugly and something that we no longer want to be a part of. Now Charlie Derry says of the film, for a political drama I found myself incredibly engaged with it, uh, with an interesting and unpredictable storyline. The Ides of March is an extremely well put together film that is highly enjoyable. Gosling gives yet another amazing performance and shows us that there's a lot more to come from him. Clooney really suits his role too and directs brilliantly and Philip Seymour Hoffman makes for a good support. Obviously, I have to agree with that. It's pretty much what I just said anyway. Um, you know, Hoffman is pretty much great in everything. However, not everyone agrees. John Johnson says, great cast aside, this was a real letdown. A West Wingian campaign film in its first half turns into a ridiculous thriller for its second, all to tell a bog standard idealism corrupted story. Giamatti and Hoffman have some fun as campaign managers, but Gosling sleepwalks through the film, as did I, sadly. The whole thing is just so predictable and ham-fistedly plotted that interest and plausibility drop out of the race long before the end. I'm not so sure about plausibility dropping out of the race, given that, let's face it, some of the politicians we know have gotten up to some pretty shady stuff throughout the years. Uh, yeah, plausibility isn't something for me that... I have trouble with in this film, nor is uh, the the issue of keeping my interest or predictability, as you call it. You know, but to each their own. Maybe you did see some of the things coming. I do think you're spot on in the West Wingian kind of uh, political thriller aspect of it. This does feel like Clooney's attempt to write something of an Aaron Sorkin nature, only without the idealism you know of Aaron Sorkin you look at the West Wing that is a very idealistic kind of um, group of people who are in the White House the kind of people that quite frankly we're never going to get in the White House this film is a lot more realistic a lot more believable I would say unfortunately uh, but yeah I think it's a really good film really great political thriller and I give it a four out of five Next up is Imperium, which is a film that sees Daniel Radcliffe playing an FBI agent who goes undercover to infiltrate a Nazi group uh, in order to try and find a terrorist among them. Uh, now, I kind of feel like I've seen a lot of this stuff before and, and done a lot better with films like American History X um, and, and, yeah, plenty of other films in, involving Nazis. But... I, I did like this film, i got to say. Um, I liked Daniel Radcliffe in this. Once again, he surprises me as an actor. Now, I do think that there are times when I don't really buy him as a skinhead, but that comes entirely down to his voice. He has a very kind of squeaky voice, does Daniel Radcliffe, um, and he can't escape that. But I still believed in this character. I still bought his performance. I think he, he, he did a good accent. He's doing an American accent in this. Um, I mean, obviously I'm not American. Uh, I'm sure many Americans would disagree, but I liked his performance. I thought he was good. Like I say, once again, he, he proves himself to be far more than Harry Potter. And what I've found on Letterboxd is that 
most of the people who criticise this film simply just jibe the fact that this is Harry Potter playing a Nazi. And I, I just feel that that is low rent criticism. To be honest, it's easy, it's pot shot, and it's not very constructive. Um, I, I actually think he gives a good performance. I also like Tony Collette in this film. What I will say is that some of the Nazis come off as caricatures rather than genuinely real people. Um, I, I think you you probably find more from a film uh, like uh, Green Room, I think. I think that treats the subject matter better. You know, the, it makes those people scary, um, fanatical, in a way that to me seemed a little bit more believable. Uh, now, that's not to say that people in this aren't entirely believable. I just feel like I've seen it before. Um, it's still a good film, although the ending is somewhat anticlimactic. It's over pretty quickly. Uh, but yeah, I, I think if, if you if you want to see a film around that kind of subject, then you could see much worse. Matt on Letterboxd says, Between this and Swiss Army Man, Daniel Radcliffe continues to show his talented range as a dramatic actor. The story definitely grabs your attention and milks as much suspense as it can, but it feels too much like every movie about an undercover cop or outsider becoming engulfed in an unfamiliar coalition of people with a hidden agenda. Radcliffe holds it all together and his transition to a skinhead is believable. But the movie follows a predictable formula and rushes through the consequences of the third act. Which, yes, as I just said, I totally agree with. Um, you know, this, this is why I like to pick the brains of people on Letterboxd. Because I, I tend to find that the things I like about a movie are also the things other people like about a movie. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that pretty much sums it up. Uh, it's a good film, I give it a 3 out of 5, but it, it's nothing special. Next up is Fast and the Furious 8, or oh, The Fate of the Furious. Uh, <laughs> what can you say about this franchise, really? Um, you either love it or you hate it. I, I happen to be on the side of the fence that loves it. Uh, I, I think from, from, from Fast 5 onwards, I, I have loved each of these movies. This one, to a lesser extent, I think, than the previous three. Um, I, I, I do think that the laws of physics, are, or the lack thereof in these films, does become a little bit too much to bear at times, um, particularly in this one. You know, they're, they're constantly upping the stakes, they're constantly making the stunts ever more ridiculous. And yeah, there comes a point where you literally have to acknowledge there and then in your seat that if I'm going to go along with this, then I have to put all logic and reason to one side. And if you can do that, then I think there's much to enjoy. Uh, I, I do think they've got far too many characters to deal with at the moment. Uh, you know, a lot of people have complained about the lack of, well, not complained, um, <laughs> it's nothing they can do to bring him back, but they've, they've noted that they miss Paul Walker in this franchise and said that they think he br would bring something to it. But I just think it would be another character to deal with, to be to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah, it's a very crowded show. I do think they build certain things up which they never pay off. So all the way through it we've got this, you know, this antagonistic relationship between Jason Statham's character and The Rock's character, Dwayne Johnson's character. Uh, and, and yeah, you, you really think these dudes, at some point in this film, are going to have to go head to head again. You know, a rematch from the last film um, and, and, yeah, fight it out. Never happens. And, and like, very early on, you see these guys start to buddy up. And, yeah. So there's, there's elements like that that you kind of think, you know, that you're going to have a payoff and you don't quite. Beyond that, though, you know, it, it, it's... It does what it says on the tin. It gets fast, it gets furious, and things blow up in rather unique ways, rather entertaining ways. And and that's kind of what I want from this franchise. Ian Bulaklak says that just the prison fight scene and the fact Jason Statham has more to do deserves this rating from me, because he gave it four stars. Fast and the Furious fans, go see it. Non-fans, stay away. It's dumb, stupid, and very silly. And I don't care, because I had such a blast with this. Yeah, that that's pretty much it, isn't it? If, if you're a Fast and the Furious fan, 
you know what you're getting. You know it's dumb. I don't think there are any fans of this franchise out there that think that this is intellectual, highbrow material. They know what they're getting. They're quite happy to switch their brains off. Um, so yeah, that's exactly what I, I was hoping for and that's exactly what I got. I wouldn't quite say this is four out of five star material, Ian, uh, but yeah, I, I get where you're coming from. I understand it. Uh, but for me, I'd give this a three out of five. Very enjoyable. Um, and yeah, if you're a Fast and Furious fan, you get exactly what you were hoping for, I think. I will just add, however, that Troy over on Letterboxd just asks the question, when are they going to make Lucas Black a part of the team? It blows my mind he isn't in this movie. And I couldn't agree more, mate, seriously. Uh, I really liked him in Tokyo Drift. And when we got that glimpse of him in the last film, I thought, oh yes, they're, they're going to start to work him back into it. And given the fact that we don't have Paul Walker anymore, it would make sense. You know, he, he carried his own film in this franchise. I, I think he would be the next logical person in, in line. So, but yeah, he isn't. So what are they doing, really? Yeah, bring bring Lucas Black back. That's 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 what I say. Next up is Their Finest, directed by Lone Scherfig, who did make An Education, which I thought was a good film, but then made, uh, was it One Day, I think, which was terrible, absolutely terrible. Uh, pr probably Anne Hathaway's worst performance in my mind, because she put a horrible accent on. Yeah, the, the film itself was just garbage. But I know a lot of people really love that film. However, this one... It's it's a good film, but it's not a great film. It gets into the realm of soap opera like you wouldn't believe, uh, and it and it it pulls the rug out from under you in ways that, quite frankly, lost me. Um, it, it it felt like a rug pull for the sake of a rug pull. Um, you know, uh, tragedy strikes in 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 several quarters and it just feels like it's there to ramp up the the soap opera elements of, of the film um however i will say bill nye in this is great uh you know it's bill nye is one of those actors that he's, he's not a particularly great actor he's, he's kind of the same in whatever he does yet he's still able to resonate with me in in all manner of ways he can make you laugh just because of his ma mannerisms, the way he says things. But he can also make you cry. Um, and I think that, yeah, that's what appeals to me about Bill Nye. And he, he does that here uh, to great effect, I think. Uh, the, the film follows this woman, played by Gemma Arterton, who becomes a script doctor. Um, and she essentially ends up writing this whole script with this team of people uh, during the Second World War. It's It's whole purpose being uh, to yeah portray a a image of british life which which will get the british public fired up um uh, but uh not in a way that feels like propaganda even though quite frankly that's that's what it is i think this has some pretty good things to say about the movie industry about the creation of stories about the way in which all fiction is essentially lies. None of it has a, uh, a, a an ending or, or anything like that. That life, I should say, doesn't have a, a sewn up ending um, the way that movies do. Everything in a movie gets wrapped up because it's making a point about something. Whereas life isn't always like that. There isn't a point to be found. Stuff just happens. I like Arston's performance. I also like Sam Clay Claflin in this, an actor that I've actually quite liked for, since I see, saw him in The Hunger Games. I liked his character in The Hunger Games. I liked him in The Hunger Games. Um, but yeah, I just feel like some of the elements, the way it's written, are forced. And it suffers from one of the worst cliches that I hate in movies, which is when you give a character a terrible boyfriend or a terrible husband or a terrible partner so that you kind of justify that person then going off and being with someone else. I hate it when they do that in movies. You see it coming a mile off in this. I I don't think that's a spoiler, quite frankly, because if you, if you don't see it coming in this film, 
then you need to watch more movies. Rob Ryan over on Letterboxd says, a part of me was considering three stars due to some of the drama moments being a little forced and not fully earned, but I can't deny that I left this film feeling very happy and uplifted, so 3.5 stars. Charming performances from the cast, along with a compelling story that held my interest throughout. It helps that I find films about the making of film to be really fascinating, and this was no exception. Yeah, I, I can kind of hear what you're saying there, Rob. I, I, you know, it did resonate with me, the film as a whole. You know, there were moments that I found genuinely touching. But for me, I, qu I can't quite forgive it. It's, uh, it's forced nature in, in the way it was written. And like I say, there was some of those cliches that really bugged me. Um, so for me, I'm not going to go that extra half star. I'm going to give this a three out of five. And so we get to my favourite film of this week's episode, my five star film, so to speak. Uh, this is Let the Right One In, a vampire movie, Swedish vampire movie, uh, that, yeah, I've only watched just recently for the second time. This was, this was my favourite film of 2009 when it first came out, but I never watched it again since, <coughs> until now. And thankfully, it has lived up to my memories of it. In fact, it's exceeded them. Uh, I got more from this second viewing than I did from that first viewing. Uh, I think this film is very worthy of being studied. I, I think that the more you look into it, the more you pull out. Now, I read a lot of comments from people who see this as a love story, uh, as a coming-of-age drama. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it's. I I'm not so sure. Um, now I think if this is a love story, it is a very one-sided one. I think this is more a story about evil, and how it often wears sheep's clothing. It's like a wolf in sheep's clothing. We have this character of Ely, who is this this vampire uh, who we believe to be female. Um, if you watch the film you'll learn otherwise but yeah uh, this little girl vampire <clears throat> and this this young boy who is being bullied at school and they befriend each other or more to the point Ely befriends the boy Oscar um, and from there on they develop this relationship which on the surface could appear as though it's a love story um, but like I say I don't believe it's mutual I believe Oscar does love this girl. He loves this vampire. Um, and it's through that love for her that he kind of finds a bit more direction in his life, shall we say. Um, although I don't think he goes anywhere that he wouldn't have gone had she not come into his life. This guy has got serial killer written all over him. Uh, it, sooner or later it would have happened. And I think that Ely sees this and she uses it. Uh, she capitalises on it. Uh, and I think she's very manipulative in this, th this film. I don't think she loves Oscar. I think she is using him as a means to an end um, because the helper that she has is getting old, getting past it, losing the will, and she needs, she needs a new one. So she starts with this kid. She befriends him and she manipulates him from start to finish. There's one scene in the film when they kiss and as they're kissing, Oscar has his eyes closed because he's really into that moment. And she doesn't. She's looking at him. She's observing him. She does not love him. She is literally manipulating him. Uh, so, yeah, let's see what some other people have to say about the film. We've got Devon who says, The performances from the two main actors are breathtakingly good. Couldn't agree more. And while both characters are immensely screwed up and lonely, their relationship is never anything less than incredibly tender and beautiful. Though not in anything resembling the conventional sense of those words. Yeah, I don't think it's beautiful. <laughs> Again, like I say, I hear this a lot from people. I, I think a lot of people see this as this kind of beautiful love story, but like a twisted one, obviously, because it's a vampire who kills people. I, I don't think it's tender. I really don't. I, th I think if you look under the surface and you see what's going on, it's actually quite sinister. It's really sinister. Like I say, it's it's... I think it has a lot to say about how evil in this world often goes unseen because it, it, it wears 
the body of a child in this case you know in, in this film's case that is uh, you know it appears to be something that it is it isn't which is innocent dirk h says the biggest mistake you can make when watching this film is approaching it as a horror film it isn't what it is is an almost existential coming of age drama that explores the limits of friendship family and love and what i love about it is that it its conclusion is that there are no limits. I think, yeah, I, I think Dirk is probably more on point there. He doesn't specify where, you know, who, who is in love with who here. But I think, yeah, I think it does show us the limits of that <clears throat> with regards to Oscar. I think his love for Ely at this point knows no limits because he's willing to give up his his. his current existence his current way of life and go off with her and well no doubt end up killing for her um, so yeah in that regard he's willing to do anything for her that there are no limits for him we've got doc cortex on letterboxd who really didn't like the film he gave it one star uh, and he says low budget films don't always have to look cheap uh, i'm not quite sure i'd say this film looks cheap uh, this film was done by, uh, it was shot, that is, by cinematographer Hoyt van Hoytema, who is one of my favourite cinematographers. He shot Interstellar. This film looks beautiful. I, yeah, so I, I, I don't really know where you get the idea from that this looks cheap, by any stretch of the imagination. Now, he goes on to say, what does the title mean anyway? His options for letting in were limited to one option as far as I could see. Could he have let the wrong one in? Could he let the right one out? At the end of the day, we don't really care. Now, that last comment, I've got to say, really shows that you've missed the point of the film. Uh, you know, you're applying that title, let the right one in, to Oscar. And I don't think you're meant to at all. I think that this is Ely's story. I think that Ely is the one who is letting the right one in. She is essentially discarding her old helper, this, this man who goes out and kills for her, who brings her blood, um, and she's finding a new one. Who do you do? Who do you trust? Who do you let into your world of vampirism if you're going to do that? It has to be someone that you can, as I say, manipulate. Someone that you know has a particular mindset about them. And Oscar is that person. This is this is a young boy who, when we first meet him, he's, he's stabbing a tree, acting out a revenge fantasy against these bullies. He collects newspaper clippings of, of uh, murders, local murders. This is a prime candidate for serial killer, you know? She recognises that. To her, he is the right one. You know, and I think that's what the title refers to. She is the one who lets the right one in. In this case, Oscar. Let the Right One In is a brilliant horror film. It is a brilliant psychological thriller that really gets under the skin of its characters and has an awful lot to say about the modern world, about the world we live in and the nature of evil. Uh, yeah, I give it five stars. Incredible film. Like I say, even better on the second watch so many years later. But that's it. There you go. That's this week's episode of Letterbox Sundays. Please do comment below and let me know what you thought about any of the films I've talked about here. Until next time, cracking. <laughs>